and welcome to the next in the series of videos that people don't want to watch. Today we are going to be looking at these and these are Rockwell 6532 Riot chips. We got them from the usual place in China and we need to know if they work. And in order to do that we are going to be using this which has just arrived from PCBWay and this is a Commodore 64 cartridge port prototype board. So I think we're going to call this video Stupid Cartridge Port Tricks. Let's do it. Now many of you will be familiar with the 6522 VIA and the 6526 CIA that are present in the Commodore VIC-20 and Commodore 64 and so on. The 6532 Riot is an older chip in the same vein as those previous ones. Riot stands for RAM IO and timer. So this basically describes what the chip is. It is 128 bytes of static RAM, two IO ports, we'll call them GPIO because that's the modern term, and an interval timer. And that will trigger a IRQ, which we know about. So that's basically what it does. It's a 40 pin dip, the same as a 6522 or a 6526. And I need to figure out a way of testing them to work out if they are A, genuine and B, functional. So, I was thinking about this. We built this little device for testing 6507s last time, but we can't really do the same thing for a 6532 because it has the 128 bytes it has a data bus, it has registers. If you've tried programming a 6526 or a 6522, you'll know that there is all sorts of modes that you can set and so on. So we need something a little more complex. Now, I thought about designing an Arduino shield for this, using something like an Arduino Mega, but we have to generate the clock frequency, we have to individually set clock pulses and clear clock pulses and do all the timing ourselves and that is quite honestly a bit of a faff. I'm sure we could do it but there is another way and the other way involves this. So this is a prototype um, cartridge development board. So we've got it plugs into the cartridge port of a Commodore 64. We have got all the data pins, the address lines, everything that comes out of that, that you would normally use to build a ROM cartridge, a game cartridge, something like that, um, that all comes out onto this breakout here. If we wanted to, we could build a ROM cartridge game with this, but we want to use some IO. We want to do, we want to talk to one of these, and we can do that because there are two lines on this interface and you may be able to see them here and here. So the benefits of the cartridge port, we have, we have all the address and data lines. We have the system clock called Phi2 and we have two special pins which are called IO1 and IO2. And these pins come from the PLA of the Commodore 64 and they give us some IO address decoding. So this is um, asserted if we are in the range of D, E, zero zero to d e f f and this 
is asserted if we are in the range DF00 to DFFF. So we can map our IO into one of these two ranges and that gives us 256 bytes in each range for our registers. Now we need quite a few bytes. A 6522 or a 6526 is only a dozen or so registers. Um, it doesn't take up a lot of space in this address. So you could break it into a 64 byte address and there are other sort of ways of doing that. But this has got 128 bytes of RAM. So that is half of this space already. And it still has all the registers on top of that. So we're gonna use an entire one of these register banks. And I suspect we're gonna use that one. So let's take a quick look at the 6532 and see what we've got. So we can categorize this in a number of ways. So here we have the A port and here we have the B port and these are bi-directional. Here we have data bus and again that is bi-directional and here we have our addresses. And I'm also going to lump these in here with that. And these, of course, are inputs. And this gives us seven address lines, A0 to A6, plus we have um, two chip select lines and this line, which is called register select. This register select line is normally put to A7. And that is what tells us whether we are going to use RAM or the registers. So typically if we have that in A7 then the first 128 bytes are the RAM and after that come the registers. RS is going to be A7 and CS2 is going to be I01 and then CS1 we're going to tie to VCC. So that gives us basically what we're going to do and what we're going to connect. And then we're going to um, basically write a program in BASIC that will talk to this. We can set the memory, we can check the memory, we can set these ports, we can check these ports. And we can generate an interrupt because we can use the timers. And PB7, I believe, has an edge detect function which means that we can use that to trigger an interrupt. And again, that is something that we can test. So what I think I'll do is I'll put some diodes on or LEDs onto the ports so that we can see them being written to. That would involve 16 LEDs. I think I might use a, um, a bar graph chip LED for that and I'm going to drive them through buffers because that will put less strain on the chip. We, we didn't use buffers when we looked at the address lines on the 6507 and arguably we could have done but we will use buffers on this one just because we're not going to be just cycling through you know addresses we're going to be deliberately setting outputs and and reading inputs and we want to do you know various different things and have buttons on here there is space for one, two, three, four, five push buttons. So we can do things like we can have a, a reset button and various things. So yeah, what I think we're gonna do is everything is gonna connect pretty much as it is expected. The address lines are gonna go to the address lines. The data lines are gonna go to the data lines. VCC and ground, of course, and then PA and PB are going to go to a combination of buttons and LEDs, and that's going to be sort of laid out on this board. So let's start laying it out. And I'm going to use a ZIF socket because we like ZIF sockets. Okay, so here's our board. It looks pretty much the same on both sides. So the edge connector comes out to these pin headers 
and they're all labelled so ground ROM H reset NMI Phi 2 a few blah, 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 and then DC down there and the other signals they also come out to this little block here you can see the line around it that is basically a mirror of that and just makes it easier to um, connect stuff up so we can start laying stuff out on the board and then it's going to be just a matter of connecting it all up and because it's just basically putting wires on the back and routing a wire from there to there to there to there to there to there, to there. we don't necessarily need to see that in all its tedium just so that I'm not going into this completely blind, I have drawn up a circuit diagram. So this is the 6532 and it is going to all the buses. So we've got the address bus, we've got the data bus and we've got the um, two port buses PA and PB. Also the various other signals are going to the appropriate places. So we've got PHI2, IO1, read write reset and irq now the two ports are going through 74 ls244 bus transceiver driver chips to a bank of leds which is a bar strip and they are connected to a resistor network which goes to ground and that is the same for both a and b I may well not use resistor strips because I've got the ones that I've got are only seven pins and I need eight for that so I would need basically to use three of them and sort of muck around a bit so I may well just use resistors we shall see and the switches I've set up I've set up two switches we've got five on the PCB um, one of them goes to PA7 and that has a 3k pull up what that does is that can be used as an edge trigger for the irq the 3k pull up is per the um, data sheet i've had a first pass at laying it out so i've got the zip socket for the 6532 i've got the two bar leds these are 10 bar leds so two of them are going to be unused I haven't decided yet whether to unuse two at the ends or one at each end on each. Um, I've put the first of the switches in. This is where the 244 buffers are going to go. I've spaced those simply so that you can push that down and it's between the two chips. Otherwise, that could have been a problem. That is oriented that way round because the data lines are that side. Uh, some of the address lines are that side and most of the port lines are going to be that side so that's really out of convenience um, these are all going to be wired on the bottom using my big stack of multicolored wires so it will probably look quite messy but we're not going to worry too much about that I've plugged this into a C64 so I can see what the clearance is and basically everything that side of here is going to be visible from outside the back of the machine so this this bit you can't use because it will be inside the machine okay so we've got our 744 chips we've got our leds i could use three and a half mil or three mil leds i've got plenty of them but they're going to take up more space okay so i'm going to solder these onto the board and then we'll come back and start wiring it there we go it's now soldered in at least the major components i've put four regular switches on there and one shorter switch that's going to be the reset switch it's a shorter version slightly different color so that it distinguishes it from these which are going to be date basic io push buttons so that's all on i haven't put resistors on here yet because i'm not entirely sure what the values are going to be and that will be a little bit of experimentation just to see what looks good and basically the next job is going to be to wire up the address lines and the data lines to the main bus and then we can actually test whether the 
functionality of that works. We don't need to have any of this output stuff in initially. So I'll wire up that and then we will come back and take another look. It's maybe not the world's neatest, but the voltage supplies are now done. So we've got five volts coming from here, going to, five volts goes to pin 20, and it also goes to pin 20 and pin 20 there. Three places, it also goes to pin 38. So let's beep it. Five volts goes to there, goes to there, goes to there, and it goes to there. It's not shorting anything else out. It's not shorting out the ground. And on the other side we have ground and that goes to this one. And that goes to pin one. It goes to pin one on these. And also pin 10 and pin 19. And finally it goes to the shell on these and one side of the contacts, which is the one nearest to that end. So that is the power done. I'm not quite sure where I shall do the other lines I think maybe the data lines will be on the top, maybe the address lines will be underneath. I'll see how it goes. So that's the address lines and data lines and other ancillary lines connected up. Have a look, I've got the data lines in blue on the top and the address lines in yellow on the back. And then the white is the ancillary lines, so that's um, phi2, the clock, uh, read, write, reset, and IRQ. The fourth one, IO1, that actually goes to CS2. That is effectively an address line, and so that has been done in yellow. That's that one here. That should be together enough now that we can plug it into a 64, and like this, it should do nothing. The C64 should boot the reset button, which is tied to the reset line. That should reset the C64, but otherwise it shouldn't do anything. But we should be able to measure signals on the buses and we should be able to see the IO1 line go if we talk to DE00, which is 56832. We haven't drawn up a map of the registers yet, but we will do that shortly okay so and then once we know that this basically works we can fill in the other bits so that we've got inputs and outputs and so on yeah the c64 is set up i have my pi 1541 which is as we know from other videos set to device 9 the cartridge is plugged into the back i have tacked a wire on here for a scope probe so that we can have a look at the signals there's nothing in any of the chip sockets, so it should do nothing. Reset button should work. Nothing else should be able to do anything. And we should see a clean startup and monitor the signals on that chip. So let's switch it on. And it has started up. So first thing that I'm going to do is try the reset switch. Pressing the reset now. Okay, the cursor's gone away. Letting go of the reset switch now. And that has reset the machine. So that works. So I've got the pin out here. Let's just have a look down the chip and see what we can see. I'm going to move the camera yet again so that we can see the scope. Right, so we can assume that some of it works because the machine has powered up. So that should be VSS, zero volts. Yes, this is on two microseconds per division. And we are at 
one volt per division. So five volts should be up here. And we'll check that. VCC is at the bottom. And there we go. That's showing 4.3. It's fine. So this is port B. We're not expecting to see anything on here because there's nothing connected. Let's go to the top. So we should see a 5. A 4. A 3. A2, A1, A0, and on the other side, A6, Phi2, that's the clock, CS1, which is pulled high, CS2, which is attached to our IO1 line. And that should be high because we are not addressing the I.O. A7. That is our read-write. That is reset and we can demonstrate that. We can press the button and it goes down. Release the button it goes up. Then we have data D0, D1, D2, D3. D4, D5, D6, D7, IRQ. There are interrupts happening, I guess. I've just set up a blank board that has got just ground and A7 with wires attached, just so that we can have a little look at that. So this is A7 under default conditions without the effect of the cartridge. And that is exactly the same. So that's showing the same effect, which I think says that it's not my cartridge doing that. Okay, good. So, wrist strap on. I've got a known working 6532. And put a black mark on there so I know that that's pin 1. Oops. So let's try it and just see what happens. Okay, that is still booting. So that's a good sign. That's not getting obviously hot. We should be able to address it and do all the stuff that we ought to be able to. Now, the address map for this is basically DE00, which is 56832. That is our 128 bytes of static RAM. And we know that because RS, RS is low for addressing the RAM. And that is attached to A7. So A7 being 0, that is going to be the first 128 bytes. After that, the next 128 bytes, A7 will be 1. So that's going to be what? DE80. And that is going to be our data register A, then D81 is our data direction register A, A82 is data register B, and A83 is DDR B. Now after that we have the timer and I haven't yet fully understood how the timer addressing works so I'm not worrying about that for now. We should be able to address the static RAM, read it and write it. We should be able to address the data direction registers and set them. That will be the easiest first test, I think. So let's write a little program. So that's going to be our data register A, 56832, which is the base um, address, plus 128 gives us data register A. So if we poke R plus 1 with 255, that should set our data direction register to be an output. We can then, that should set everything to be 1. That's a little delay. 
that should set everything back to zero. That's a little delay. Right, so base register, set data direction register output. Then we can put everything to one, wait for a bit, put everything to zero, wait for a bit, go back. Should be go to 20. And I'm going to save that just so that we don't lose it. That should just show us what we are um, writing at this particular time. Right. So, that shows us the speed that we are doing it. And that's interesting, nothing is happening. That should be A7, PA7. And it should be going up and down roughly several times a second. It is not. We may have the, the address wrong, of course. CS2. That is showing us selecting. There we get. Future Tim here. At this point, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole. I tried multiple versions of the board and I couldn't get anything to work. So this was my original board. I rebuilt the board using ribbon cables and um, DuPont connectors. You can see this has still got the sticky up pins on it. And I tried doing a similar board but using a 6522. And that's this one. And that didn't work either. I tried another board with a 6526. That's this one. And that didn't work either. I did try putting just a 2K static RAM on it. And you can see that's here. And that did work. It did prove one thing. It proved that the interface did work. And I knew that data things were going to data things and address things were going to address things. IO things were going to IO things. And so I went to Discord and a lovely chap there called Andre Fachat, I hope I've said that right, came up with what I think was the reason and also the solution. And the reason is that on the Commodore 64, the VIC-2 chip steals the bus for a certain amount of time and does its video-y things and then gives the bus back for everything else to do their I.O. things, their memory things and so on. But it is not very clean about it. And consequently, the I.O. chips are sensitive to that bus being in the wrong condition just at the time when it's expecting the data to be valid. And so he had a solution for this. And the solution is basically to retard the Phi 2 clock just a little bit so that when the clock is valid, the address bus has settled down, the data bus has settled down, all the other signals are happy. And to do that, he used a 74LS74, which is a flip-flop, and he gave an example circuit, and that's what we're gonna do. Now, because all this messy wiring on the back and all this messy wiring on here and so on, and PCBs being very, very cheap from our sponsor PCBWay, I built a PCB. And I put the flip-flop on here and everything else is exactly as it was before. I've even put the prototyping area on the top so that we can build our LEDs and stuff and we can not be constrained by some fixed circuit board. So, back to the plot. These have just arrived, which is the PCB that I have built of this and it has the 74LS74 flip-flop for clock shaping and stuff. I put a, um, what do you call it, prototyping area on it so that we're not constrained by what I sort of half decided to do on that. And uh, well, with this one with the LEDs and the, it's got the RAM on it. 
this was our first one and you can see I never even got as far as putting chips in those hopefully this is going to work we shall see so maybe yellow wasn't the best color to do it in but there we go I've put the register map on the back as a reminder, I've called it the 6532 Playground because hopefully we can play with the GPIO. So let's build it up. Now the intention was originally to use these, to use this as a chip tester. But I've had to make use of those chips already and so they were tested in another way. This is one that I got from somewhere else and I know is working. So one final thing and that is a jumper. So I've got a little bag of jumpers, any colour you like. It's a bit boring but it does stand out against the other colours. Now that sets whether we're using IO1 or IO2 and that is on IO1. So this should be all ready to go. This is our reset switch. This um, simply hooks up IRQ or not according to whether you have the jumper. And these are port B and port A and we've got ground all the way down that so we've got plenty of choice for ground connections. 5 volts down both sides. So in this area we can hook up logic, we can hook up LEDs, we can hook up switches, we can do what we like. But we need to see if it works first. Let's switch it on and see what happens. Good sign. And it's powered up, that's good. Not immediately burning hot, that's also good. So we can write a little test program. We'll just try the static RAM to start with. Sort of random numbers. So that should go through and it should put um, 0 to 127 in 0 to 127 registers and then that should display them again put some blank lines in there okay let's try it and no 2420 let's They're different every time. Just in case I got those backwards, let's change that to five seven zero eight eight. That looks more like it's just uninitialized uninitialized. Um, I.O. space. Let's just write that as all zeros. And all ones. Just going to comment that line out because we don't need to list that every time. Ah! So let's try 
just the top four bits. So that's going to be 240. That's good. And let's try the bottom four bits. Hmm. So let's address the elephant in the room. I was working on this um, off camera and somehow I managed to kill the other Commodore 64. That is now in the sick bay waiting for a new super PLA and those are quite expensive. Anyhow, this is the bread bin that we looked at last time and it is now standing in for our original 64. So what I was doing was because we had the problem where we couldn't get um, the same numbers going into the SRAM coming out of the SRAM. I had another look and I went back to the guys on Discord and um, Andre Fashat in particular is to thank for this. He discovered that the flip-flop that I'm using and the way I've got it rigged up, okay. and I'll show you that, the flip-flop that I'm using as it's wired up here is in fact retarding the Phi 2 clock by two dot clock cycles instead of one and that is too much. So what I've done is I've so I've taken off the signal from here. Try to mod. And I'm feeding that into the Phi2 input on the chip. So you see this brown wire coming off that is leading to my new modified Phi2 signal. The purple wire here is the original Phi2 signal. And you can see that on the oscilloscope. The green signal is the original Phi2, slightly wobbly. And the yellow signal is the modified Phi2. And you can see that the leading edge is retarded a little bit from the original signal and the trailing edge is pretty much still bang on. It's the trailing edge that is important in here, um, in this particular system, because that is where the data is actually clocked in, I think. So I will run you through some numbers. Let's go onto the screen. This is an unusual little program. That it's calling a piece of machine code that writes the number that is input into the SRAM and then reads it out. So before we did 255 and that worked fine. But when we went to low values, let's say zero, it didn't work fine. But now whatever number we put in there comes straight back out. So that's working. So we've got the IO signals. This is just in the default state. We've got the RAM signals. So now we need to look at the timer and that's next. Okay, we are, I think, starting to get somewhere. Now I've switched over to the PCB version because as you can see on the back, my um, proto board version, it is getting rather intense. And I think that is sort of prone to error in some respects because of all the wires and stuff being underneath, buried under some wires. And um, yeah, I could have laid, laid that out a lot neater. Um, it is what it is. So I've switched to 
the not quite final PCB, which has basically, it's the same form factor as this. The reason being that to get a $5 board for $5, it needs to be no bigger than 10 centimeters square. So this is conveniently 10 centimeters square and it fits in there. And I've split it into two. So we have a proto board section and then the um, section with, with the test IC and a bit of logic decoding and stuff. So what I've done with this board, we've got um, a 74LS74, which is our little flip-flop that is retarding the Phi 2 clock. And we've got our IC under test. Little jumper that lets us switch between IO1 and IO2. And then we've got a little thing that lets us set whether we're going to use interrupts and if that is going to generate an interrupt in the C64. Because it's not, I've got that tied to a 3K3 resistor which goes up to its um, tying it to 5 volts as per the data sheet. Then for our little test LEDs, I've got that's actually port A and that's actually port B. Um, yeah, maybe they should be the other way around, but they're not. Uh, they were laid out because port A is that side of the chip and port B is that side of the chip. This is a HCT 541, which is a buffer similar to, um, what is it, the 244, 244 and 245. Um, but this is laid out in such a way that all the inputs are on this side and all the outputs are on that side. So it makes it very much easier to wire it up. And there's two of these. So that one's for port B and that one's for port A. And then there's just LEDs off the output side and they're driven by, or they're driving resistors which go to ground. Now on this board, I've got, oops, I've got a strip of five volts down the outside and ground down the middle. So it's easy just to tie stuff up. Then the input switches, they are tied to ground and they basically just go to PA4567 and PB4567. So they're the high order bits simply because there's space for four switches. Then I've got some standoffs here just to support it. And it's wired up on the back. Yes, I've got a bodge wire because I cocked up the flip-flop. So as you can see, the A and B ports are just wired straight through to the buffer chips. And then the buffer chips are wired up to the switches and... Well, the switches go straight through to the ports, but the buffer chips are buffering the outputs. Now you will see when we plug this in and switch it on, these lights immediately will come on. And the reason for that is that the natural state of the I.O. ports on this is logic high. Partly because it's NMOS and partly because I think there are internal pull-up resistors. So everything is going to be naturally high. And that means that everything will be switched on to start with. This is another reason to have buffers here because that is then not going to draw too much current from the chip itself. Okay, let's plug it in and I'll show you the tests and what works and what doesn't. Okay, that's my trusty little pie. So let's power it on. And there you see the LEDs come on. Right, okay, so I'll load up my test program. I've rewritten this entirely as a single suite program and it's written in BASIC and it runs at the speed of BASIC, but that's fast enough to see what's going on. And we will walk through it and show you what works and what doesn't. And then we'll look at how the program works. Pi Zero is set as device nine. One day I will get there we go, you can see it's 17 blocks, so it's quite long. One day I'll get round to installing Jiffy DOS on this machine. 
I've nicked the 8 key from my other keyboard because it was too bouncy otherwise. So without looking at how the program works, we're just going to run it. Now, this jumper here switches between IO1 and IO2, but the first option on here is to swap the base address. By default, the program runs at DE00, which is IO1, and you can change it by pressing 1 to DF00, which is IO2. We are, in fact, connected to IO1. So we're going to go through these in order, test, two is the RAM test. We've got two RAM tests, a quick test and a long test. And the quick test just writes 00, zero and then FF. And there we go, that passed. The full test writes um, a one bit to each of the eight bits, one, two, four, eight, 16, and so on. And then it writes a zero bit to all the eight bits. So it's F-E, whatever. So, full test. So it's gonna go through that, and because it's written in basic, it's a little bit slow. But there we go, that wasn't too long, and that has passed that test. So we go back to the main menu. Now we can go to our port output test. This is the fun one. First thing it does is turns the LEDs off. I should really do that at the beginning of the program rather than just at this test, but there we go. So we can do a binary counter on DDRA, which is that one. You can see it just counts up. Hit a key, that turns it off. We can do a binary counter on port B. That does exactly the same thing. And then we can do a binary counter on both ports. Now I had to think about that because port B is on the left and port A is on the right. But you can see it does do that, and I'm not going to wait to. Oops, that's obviously a bug in the program. Okay, so as you've probably guessed, the next one is a sweep for port A. Sorry, yes, port A. And a sweep of port B. And then a sweep of both. Another bug, I have left that bit turned on, so I'll have to fix that. Then I am going to go to test number five, which is the timer test. It doesn't show anything on here, but it does a quarter second timer. And every time the timer goes off, it writes a T to the screen. So, and now, put test number four, the input tests. This is what I cannot get to work. So, what I'm showing on the screen is data direction register A, data direction register B, and data port A and data port B. So, by pressing these buttons, and if you look at this, you can see that the LED goes off. That should register on the screen. But it doesn't. And the same for port B. So the problem seems to be that we are not actually setting 
the data direction registers. And I haven't figured out at the moment why not. So if this is still set as being an output, then obviously what we are seeing on the port is just going to be a reflection of the data that we've put there. And in fact, that is another problem that if I run the sweep tests and actually look at the input data or the port data rather as I'm doing a sweep, so only one LED will actually be lit at a time, then I'm not actually seeing that reflected on the port either. So I need to think what is going on. I suspect it has something to do with the read write line, but I don't quite know what. So I'm going to hook up um, a scope display and compare the read write line to the clock and see what that tells us. Okay, so I've put a wire onto the modified Phi 2 clock wire and also onto the read write line. This is our ground for the scope and we can plug this in and have a look at the signals. So we've got the board running and it's hooked up to the oscilloscope. It's currently sitting on the input screen and let's look at the scope trace. So what we've got is the modified Phi 2 clock in green and the read write signal in yellow. It's triggering on the rising edge of the read write signal. So what we see is that the rising edge appears to be kind of unstable and it's wobbling about and it's very slow. It's not a nice crisp edge like the trailing edges or like the clock edge is and I wonder if that is causing the problem. So one thing we can do is buffer that signal and that will straighten those edges up and it'll give us a nice thing like that. If that's going to fix it, that would be nice. I don't know at this stage, but that's going to be my first try. So I've made this little um, buffer board, which is just a 74LS244 octal bus driver and in fact I'm only using one lane from it so everything else is basically tied to ground and I've got a little four pin adapter for it so that end one is ground that one is five volts signal in signal out and I'm going to put it on this board initially because it's easier just to hack some signals and that will just tack in there like that and then we'll try it out and see how it does. Okay so that's attached and we've got ground in out 5 volts. So in is the green and it comes from the read write signal out goes to the chip and volts of volts. Let's plug it in and see what it does. Let's power it up. So let's just look at our read write signal. So remember that is in. And that's exactly what we had before with the ragged rising edge. And then this is our out. That's much neater. Okay, so I'll just hook the scope up to these other leads and we can see what's going on. So once again, that is our clock and our read-write signal. Right, let's load the test. So this is hardwired to DF00, so we need to change the address. And let's go port input tests. We've only got four buttons. And it looks like it's exactly the same. So press the button. Nothing's happening. So that didn't fix it. So I had a little thought and I went back to the original version of this 74 LS74 flip-flop. If you remember we changed it so it only used one side 
and we took a tap off pin 5 and took that to the phi 2 clock input. Now the reason that we did that was that when we were using pin 11, so both sides of the flip-flop, the static RAM did not work, but the GPIO did. And I couldn't remember if when we looked at that, that we checked the inputs as well as the outputs. So I've put back the original version of this flip-flop, i.e. basically I've undone the bodge wire and this now uses both sides of the flip-flop. So we can expect the static RAM not to work, but we can check now the input side and I've got the input tests set up on the screen here. So we should just be able to press the buttons and see if it works. Now immediately you can see that the data direction registers are showing zero before they showed 255. So it's correctly set those up. Now if I press the button, that's gone to 127, 191, 223, 239. And you can see the corresponding LED goes up. And same with port B. 127, 191, 223, 239. So we've got a situation where depending on where we tap that uh, modified Phi 2 signal, we can either test the RAM aspects of this and the output and the timer, or we can test the GPIO aspects of this and not the RAM. Unfortunately, I would rather have liked to have a single board that would test everything, but I don't know how we could change that so that this would actually work for everything. This has kind of um, reached the limit of my electronics knowledge, at least as far as flip-flops go and modifying clock signals and so on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, I was playing with the AND gate on this um, protoboard version and basically getting nowhere. And then I had an idea, and that was basically, why not put the AND gate on the output of the Phi 2 modified clock from the flip-flop? And one of the things that I had noticed was that the flip-flop retarded the Phi 2 clock at both ends, so at the leading edge and at the trailing edge. And I think the trailing edge there was causing the problem. And by putting the AND gate in and ANDing that signal with the original Phi 2 clock, that brings the trailing edge, the descending edge, back to where the original Phi 2 clock trailing edge was. And so I tried that. And as you can see, we have got the sweep LEDs running. So let's just zoom in on the screen. So we can go back to the main menu, do our input tests. And now you see that the data direction registers are showing zero, which is correct. And if we press these buttons, not only does the LED go out, but the value changes on the screen and with port A as well. So that's working. The output is working. The input is working. Main menu. So let's do the RAM tests. This is the one that was going to fail. And that's working. Let's do the full test. So we've got our RAM reading and writing, we've got our IO, IING and OING, and let's just do the final test, which is the timer test, number five. And we're getting T's. T's indicate that the timer has timed out and generated not an actual interrupt, but it has set the interrupt flag. 
the interrupt is being redirected by this little wire so it's not actually going to the CPU. So there we have it. Eventually we've got a working 6532 Riot tester. So if you've got this far, thank you so much for um, sticking it out. And um, I think this might actually find its way into the PCBWay shared projects library. So check it out there. I will put a copy of the program somewhere that you can try out as well. And um, thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Check out my Patreon if you want to support me in that way. And I will see you next time. See ya. Bye.